These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red. All his body looked like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of the game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is the birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is Genesis chapter 25, verse 19 to 34. Thank you to Zoe for reading so beautifully for us. I wonder if you'd join with me in prayer. Jesus, come and be our teacher. Come and inspire us by your word to be a people of faith. Come and deepen within us a trust and a confidence in you, that we can hope in your promises. For we pray this in your name. Amen. There are some people who find it difficult to engage with the Bible. They read the texts and they make comments like it's how hierarchical, it's patriarchal, um, there's so much violence and war, genocide. Um, and there's such brokenness in the text that they struggle to see God at work or present in it. And in some sense, when we listen to what has just been read, we, we have some of those questions as well. Here is a family, two boys already doing battle in the womb. Can one uh, see more clearly sin rooted into the DNA of us as human beings than two children doing battle in the womb. And them growing up in a family where, where that division, that bias of one parent against, uh, towards one child and against the other, kind of stalks and fashions and forms and shapes their lives, defines their futures in such profound ways. I don't know what it must have been like for them to know that you are the favourite of, of one parent and somehow looked over by the other. I wonder what that does to you emotionally, psychologically and I wonder what kind of wounds you carry when you experience that kind of family relationships. Of course then we have to ask the simple question was that God's dream or desire? It would be easy to say well well, God spoke that over that those children where, when Rebecca was asking, why is there so much movement within me? It would be easy to say, well, God defined them in that way. But there's a strange thing that knowing does not always force something to happen. Sometimes my children know how I will behave or act if they do something. Does that mean they're forcing me to act in that way? I don't think so. I think they just got to know me and my character and my way of being. But I always have the freedom of choice to move within that. 
And so I don't think God defined these two children, Esau and Jacob. Rather, they had their own characters and were shaped by the sin and brokenness of their family. And what I find so beautiful and amazing about this text is that in this text, God does not give up on this family. It could so easily have been that God would say, no, no, this family is troubled and stained and marked by sin, by division and enmity and envy and, and, and kind of fighting amongst each other. I can do better elsewhere. And I think God could probably have done better elsewhere. But you see what's so beautiful about this story, although it's completely a story about a family with favoritism and bias and prejudice, that the God we meet in the story is not in any way like that. God has no favorite. God has no bias. The most beautiful, graceful moment of the story is that God chooses to be active and present in the lives of those who are broken wounded and sinful. This is the great good news of this text, that God actually has no favorites. And if this is true for this family, if this is true for Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Esau, then can I suggest to you that it may well be true for us, that the God we worship has no favorites. It's even remarkable to notice how often God acts out that, that value by choosing in certain particular ways in Scripture. When, when there's a couple who is struggling to have children, which would have been seen to be a curse, and they would probably be marginalized, excluded in their families and communities, who does God choose? But that couple to bring forth His grace and love into the world. When there's a need for a new leader, who does God choose? Does God follow the cultural defined stereotype of the eldest, the brightest, the biggest, the leader of the community? No. So often God chooses the least. So that King David is chosen from the youngest of the brothers, the least of the tribes. And so it is that it seems that in a world where we practice favoritism, bias and prejudice, the God we find in Scripture, the golden thread of God we find in Scripture, is of a God who is seeking to undermine that reality. Of course we see that most beautifully demonstrated in the life of Jesus. How he refused to, to buy into the systems that oppressed and denied people access, refused to allow people to believe that they were not worthy, and how he rather, in conversation, in presence, in being, in hospitality and welcome, enabled them to discover that they were worthy, loved, that God has no favorites. I think particularly of the story of Mary and Martha. I always thought it was a story about one hard-working person, busy, caught up with things, and another who took the time to be close to Jesus. Until I discovered that women were not allowed to sit at the feet of a rabbi, not allowed to learn the scriptures, and that when Jesus says she has chosen the better thing, he's making the most radical statement of including women in the life of faith, of drawing them and giving them dignity and meaning. And so I have to be honest that I really need to at times allow Scripture to read me. That's often when I read Scripture, I can so often read into Scripture my own biases, my own prejudices, my, my own way of thinking. And so even in the language I use, the way I see things, and it really takes a profound movement of God's Holy Spirit, which I believe we do encounter in the reading of Scripture, that moves me to a place of deeper understanding, and not just deeper understanding, but transformation. That as I encounter God, encounter God's Word, I am shaped and formed, and I can sometimes choose the better thing, just like Mary did in subverting the cultural norms that were oppressive. 
I would want to suggest to you today that the amazing beauty of the story is even though it's defined in so many ways by cultural prejudices and bias and favoritism, it's an also a story which is transformed by the womish love of God that embraces all. And what I find so beautiful about the story is although it starts, it would seem, even in the womb with division, the story does not end there. We, we get to follow in the path of the life of Jacob. And we get to see how he has encounters with God. And we see that one day he returns. And when he returns, he finds not an enemy in his brother, but a friend. Surprised and unexpected, he discovers that Esau does not see him as an enemy, is not vengeful or hateful of him, despite some of the deceit, anonymity and envy that had taken place. And again, this is good news for me. That even though our families can be so defined by sin and brokenness, that does not mean that our future has to be defined by that. And so I wonder today, if there's any bias or prejudice, a practice of favoritism that maybe has slipped into your soul unnoticed, that maybe you have simply grown up with that. And I just wonder if it's even possible that the God you worship could be busy right now in your life subverting and undermining that belief that practice, that way of being, and instead fashioning and forming a new way of thinking and a new way of seeing and a new way of responding and reacting, a way that leads to life and life in abundance. I think what we need in this world so desperately is people who will will not allow themselves and in particularly will not allow their view of their faith and their picture of God to be defined by their culture in such a way that they cannot let God show them a new way. And so today, could I ask you and invite you to maybe just think, is there any group of people, is there any relationship which may be defined by some sense of judgment, bias, prejudice, or hate. And could you, could you bring that group of people in prayer into the presence of the God who has no favorites? And could you allow yourself, as you bring them in prayer, into the presence of the God who has no favorites, to notice how God looks at those folk, at those people, at that group of people. And to notice perhaps that, that the God we worship, the God who has no favorite, looks with love. Maybe also, perhaps you'd want to maybe just look into the eyes of God yourself. Maybe what you also need is to notice that because God has no favorites, you are favored. Because all are favored. All are loved. So can I leave that homework with you? Could you bring into the presence of God in prayer anyone who you're struggling with, with prejudice or bias? There is so much going on in our world. I don't think it's difficult. And we have often been indoctrinated or taught in so many broken ways. But God has not given up on this family. God instead longs to heal, restore and make whole. So that even though our past has been defined in such ways, our future doesn't have to be. May God grant us that gift to be new and to see in new ways. Amen. Would you pray with me, friends?
God, we thank you for the amazing gifts of this, this account of this family, who even though their lives are stained with sin, they are surrounded with grace. Even though they each carry wounds of their relationships, you are present as the healer. Even though it would seem that their lives will tear their relationships apart, you are seeking to mend and make whole. And we simply ask that you would come and fill us with that same presence and power that you revealed to them in those days. That we too might find the paths that lead us back to friendship with those we've struggled with. And that we might find uh, the scales in our eyes falling off so that we can see each other in new and powerful ways that give dignity. And honor that each person we meet is made in your image. Help us to let go of our prejudice, our bias. Help us to begin to see the world the way you see it. With no favorites. Because you are the God who has no favorites. We pray this in your strong and beautiful name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Uh, we're going to continue in worship, but just before we do that, next week we are hoping to live stream this on Facebook. I will be forming a group on Facebook and inviting those of you who are on Facebook. Please try to connect with me if you haven't. And we're hoping then at 9 o'clock next week that as uh, the service rolls out, we will be able to all view that together for those of us who are able. And we'll be able to then comment and connect and just maybe reflect together in a little way. And in so doing, uh, meet with each other in some way in the midst of this pandemic. Please do keep safe. Please do remember that your practice of isolation brings life where perhaps death would stalk the paths of another. So please practice social distancing, keep your mask on, wash your hands, and seek your, to limit your contact to the minimum. We're going to continue in worship now. Thank you. <laughs>